Hello everyone, how are you all guys doing? Here we are at the podcast Turning the Lights On. I'm here with Craig Biro and Thiago Antonioli, and we are very happy to have you here listening to us. By the way, uh, before starting, I just wanted to say that the Sao Paulo Institute for Leader Development is an independent and private association aimed at encourage, encouraging classic liberal values in Brazil through its members and extensive partner network. We believe that ordinary citizens are the true protagonists of the ideas of freedom. And now presenting uh, these two marvelous people that are with me today. First, Thiago Antonioli. He is the cultural manager of EFL Sao Paulo, graduated in business administration from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul and responsible for strategy and planning at the startup Daqui. Craig Biro, he is the co-founder and executive director of the Objective Standard Institute, co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Ob Objective Standard, and executive director of the Prometheus Foundation. His books include Loving Life, The Morality of Self-Interest and the Facts that Support It, and the forthcoming Forbidden Facts, Moral Truths Your Parents, Preachers and Teachers Don't Want You to Know. Well, it is a pleasure to have you here, Craig, and you as well, Thiago. Before we start, I just wanted to uh, ask if you, how you guys are doing and uh, how was your week and how are you guys eager to talk about leadership today uh, i'm delighted to be here thanks for having me and uh having a great week so far getting over a cold so i've got a bit of a uh, bit of congestion i might cough a little bit during the, our discussion but other than that life is awesome great thanks for being here craig it's a pleasure uh, having you here on our podcast and i hope our chat is going to be pleasant to you as it's going to be pleasant to us and also, I'd like to say that I have one of your books right here, Loving Life. I've Good. read it, and it's a, it's a great read. Uh, it's it's very fun to read, and it's uh, I like it that it's a very prescriptive, you can say prescriptive philosophy. It really helps you love life, as you said in the in the title here. So, really interesting. Good, good. Great, great. And Craig, just for us to warm up a, a bit, even though the three of us already know ourselves, our public still don't know you so please tell us a little bit about yourself your trajectory and how you became a leader in this objectivist and uh, uh, civil society movement in the united states and we can even say across the globe sure so uh, the, the relevant points about me for our discussion today are basically just that i love ideas uh, particularly ideas that help us to to think clearly and live fully. Uh, that's my, my mission in life is to zero in on those ideas, the, the ideas that help us to keep our minds connected to reality so we can live beautiful lives in reality. And that involves uh, everything from understanding what we need to do on a personal level to, to get our lives in order and, and uh, choose goals that really fill our lives with meaning and joy and pursue those goals. So, so at a personal level, just, you know, living and, and flourishing. Um, at a social level, I want uh, I want to help people understand the ideas that we need to understand so that we can live together in harmony rather than, you know, at war with each other uh, and um, and live beautiful lives, uh, producing and trading with each other and helping each other to live beautiful lives. And at the political level, uh, the ideas that we need in order to make all of that possible, right? The political conditions that we need if we want to live fully as human beings. And uh, and that, of course, is the political condition primarily of freedom, which which depends on an understanding of individual rights and an understanding of proper morality and an understanding of the, the importance of reason and understanding all of this. So uh, who I am is the, a guy who's interested in all of that and who loves to talk about it and um, and write about it and teach about it. And uh, so I'm happy to be here. I know you guys are all about leadership and that's a, a massive, um, a massively important um, aspect of the lives of people who choose leadership as, as a part of their career or, or their lives. And uh, all of these philosophic ideas pertain to that. So there's lots to talk about. Amazing. Great answer, Greg. And uh, I, we understand that 
the framework for the all of those things that you said for flourishing life for having a morality uh your framework is the objectivist philosophy that uh derived from the philosopher Ayn Rand uh would you explain it to us what what it is about uh how the objectivism works would you further elaborate on that first please yeah sure so <clears throat> Ayn Rand's philosophy called objectivism is um basically all about you and your life and your happiness that's the the starting point to know about is that um the reason that this philosophy matters is because your life matters and your mind matters and your mind is your means of making your life great so um her philosophy is all about how to understand that um it's it's about reason in terms of methodology and it's about life in terms of the goal and by life we mean a, a flourishing life a life that is full of the values that uh that that give you great joy and uh, and make life worth living so um that's the starting point with rand it's it's your life matters and your mind matters and from there we want to look at okay if if the you know her her view is that the goal is to live a wonderful life and for you to do that and for everyone to do that so how do we do that what what are the facts of reality that we need to understand and what principles do we need to grasp and, and apply in order to do that so rand's philosophy basically answers those questions um and you know one of the things we need to do is we need to understand the basic nature of reality uh what wh what is this place where we are this this environment in which we live wh are, does it th does it run by uh you know laws of of uh, of reality that we have to abide by or can miracles happen and anything can happen at any time right do, do things have a nature and an identity so that I know if I get in my car and start driving, it's not going to turn into a pillar of salt, or uh, or an eggplant, or whatever. You know, no, it's 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 got an identity, right? So that Ayn Rand's uh, basic view of the nature of the world is that we live in a world that's run by natural law. Things are what they are. We have to abide by the nature of reality, right? There's a real there's a real place out there that we live in, and the goal of our mind is to understand that place so that we can live. So this sets aside all of the the philosophic mumbo jumbo about there's no such thing as reality man or we can make up whatever we want or some guy in the sky named god can create miracles and make things happen uh you know make things act in ways that are contrary to their nature a, a snake can talk a woman can turn into a pillar of salt and all that nonsense rand says that that's ridiculous we we live in quite obviously a place where things are what they are and act in accordance with their nature so let's figure out how to live there and the beautiful thing about rand's philosophy is she takes ideas seriously and if, if you're, if you're going to live by ideas um then you need to you know you need to take them seriously and she does so that that's her basically her metaphysics her idea about the nature of the world in which we live um and it's very aristotelian she agrees with aristotle that things are what they are they act in accordance with their natures and the job of our mind is to understand that so we can figure out how to live um so this sets aside by the way right away at the beginning of rand's philosophy here you can see she's setting aside all the supernatural nonsense that we hear from religionists and she's setting aside all of the relativistic subjectivist nonsense that we hear from modern philosophers who say that um you know there's no external reality everything's just made up and or you know whatever your culture agrees to is true for you all of that she, she says no there, there's a world and we need to figure out what its laws are so we can live in that world so you think that she agrees to absolutes is that she that agrees to absolutes exactly that's a good good way to sum up the the essence of her metaphysics there there's an absolute reality and if we want to live in that reality we have to understand it uh, nature to be commanded must be obeyed right as as uh, uh <clears throat> as Bacon put it so the essence of her the base of her philosophy is that and then she says well what's our means of understanding reality what's our means of figuring that out and here she differentiates uh, again from both religion and from subjectivism the religious religious people say well you can know some truths by reason but the really important truths like you know whether god exists and what morality is all about and all of that you get that from faith and revelation 
say, say the religious people. And uh, the subjectivists say, no, you know, we don't see any evidence for God. And so you, we just make up what's true and what is good and what we should do. It's just a matter of, of, of our collective whim or my personal opinion, right? That's sort of the subjectivist side. And Rand says no to both of those. And she says, the fact of the matter is uh, that reason is our means of knowledge. We know what's true by looking at reality and conceptualizing uh, the things that we perceive and forming uh, abstractions, concepts, and generalizations and principles. And that's how we understand the world. And none of this is to say that emotions aren't important. She doesn't say reason is the only thing that matters in the whole world. Uh, she says, no, reason is your means of knowledge and emotions are extremely important aspects of your life, but they're not your means of knowledge. So just keep these two things straight. Your, your emotions are your means, your psychological means of understanding or excuse me, of, of experiencing your values, the things that are important to you. If you guys are into leadership, if uh, if you are leading a company and a, and a team really well and things are going smoothly, you feel really great. Why? Because that's an enormous value to you. It's something you've chosen that serves your life. So it feels great. If things go bad, uh, things go south for you and your team. If, if uh, you know, uh, maybe s somebody botches an account and you lose uh, some business, right? You, you feel negative emotions because your values are being affected. So your emotions are really important, right? They help us to experience our values in this world, but they're not our means of knowledge. And faith is not our means of knowledge. And feelings are not our means of knowledge. Reason is our means of knowledge. So there's R Rand's second level, right? We got reality and reason. Then we get to her morality. Uh, how should we act? And if we take reality and reason seriously, right? It, it, and we look at the world, we say, well, if we want to live and have wonderful lives, we're gonna have to go after our values. We're gonna have to not give up you know, more important things for less important things. If leadership's really important to you, you need to go after a career in leadership and not dilly dally around uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, surfing the internet and uh, and playing video games when you ought to be working on leadership. There's nothing wrong with surfing the internet or playing video games, but you need to take your life seriously. So, you know, get your life in order and go after the values that are really going to help you to build your life. And implicit in this very idea that you should take your life seriously and live it by by means of your reasoning mind is this idea of rational egoism. Rational meaning use your mind, use your reason, and egoism meaning e ego is is Latin for I or or self. It's basically take yourself, your life, me, you, whoever the individual is, take it seriously. Go after this thing, make a beautiful life. So that's the essence of then of her ethics, and because we're talking about principles in Rand's ideas. It's not just the case that you guys should go after your values and I should go after my values. Everyone should go after his or her values. And we should all do that in a harmonious way whereby, you know, I don't attack you and you don't attack me. Instead, you produce and I produce. And then if we want to trade with each other to, uh, you know, trade value for value, we can do that. And this is Rand's trader principle, which is core to her, the social aspect of her philosophy which is that um, each individual uh, is, is an end in himself. He lives his own life and should. And when we want to engage with each other and get the enormous values that we can from other people, we need to do that by mutual advantage and, uh, and trade. That brings us to Rand's uh, political philosophy, which is if we want to do all of those things in this reality, going by our own judgment and, and rational thinking and working to produce and trade values, we need a political context in which all of that is possible. What is that context? That context is a political system in which the initiation of physical force is taken out of the equation. You're not allowed to do that. Why? Because if we use force against each other, we can't act on our own judgment. If I, if I put you in a cage, you can't act on your judgment. If you hit me with a club, you know, I'm, I'm down on the ground. I can't do the things I planned to do today, right? So just at a perceptual level, we can see that it's true that in order for us to live, we have to be able to act on our judgment. So that's it. You've got her basic view of reality. There is a reality. It's got natural laws and we have to abide by those laws. 
Reason is our means of understanding that. That does not mean emotions aren't important. They're extremely important, but they're not our means of knowledge. Going after your own values and and uh, and 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 making a beautiful life for yourself and respecting the rights of others to do the same. That's the core ethical framework. And then a political system that enables all of that to happen by establishing freedom, political freedom as the law of the land. So it's this beautiful philosophy that enables everyone to live a, a beautiful personal life, to live in harmony with each other socially, and to have a political system of freedom. And that's that's the essence of her view. This was a really, really good sum up of Ayn Rand's idea. Thank you for sharing with us, Craig. And it is uh, interesting to me because when I hear you saying all of these uh, parts of her ideas, everything for me is very sound and logical and even reaches the point of being a common sense. But when we talk to, let's say, ordinary people, people who on average are not that interested in political economy, philosophy, and other areas of the knowledge regarding humanities, let's say that, and we, we, get to, uh, we get to see that they don't share this basic common sense. Let me give you a proper example. For, uh, we always have this saying that when we look at the stars or when we see the size of the ocean, we see how little we are. And I remember in one of uh, Engren's novels, uh, I think it was on uh, Atlas Shrugal, that the, uh, I think it was Danny, the, the main character in the book, one of the main characters, she says, when I see, or, or maybe it was John Galt, I don't remember quite well, but the, the person said, when I see the ocean and the mountains and how everything's so big, I see how the human, the humankind can dominate and, you know, can uh, make this place even better and how we are able to accomplish greater things such as the explorers of 500 years ago. And uh, I always, I, I used to think about that. And finally, I thought to myself, okay, I'm not alone in this world. And this is really nice. Uh, so my point is, uh, when we talk to these people, who has a different common sense than, than us, let's say, uh, the type of vocabulary that objectivists uses, such as egoism, selfishness, can be a bit provoking to, the, to them or even shocking. So I wanted you to elaborate this on us. How do we get these people to think like us and to see that what we are talking is not something extraordinary, but maybe something that in deep inside they could think uh, that it is agreeable and uh, that they could, uh, they, could, they could use in their own lives? Yeah, good, good question. And, and you know, the way that I present, presented these ideas a minute ago uh, does come across really as sort of common sense because what I'm doing is I'm just focusing there on the positive aspect, really. You know, I'm, I'm differentiating it a little bit, saying, you know, reason is your means of knowledge, not faith or emotions. But I'm focusing on reason. And people on a certain on a certain level understand that you know what's true by using your observation and logic, right? When you're going to cross a street, you don't close your eyes and say, you know, faith, tell me when it's a good time to go, right? You open your eyes and you use your mind and you know that a truck is a truck. And if it hits you, you're going to die. So don't cross when the truck is coming, right? So it is, there is a common sense element of this that anyone can get pretty easily. The problem is that people have been taught due to bad philosophic ideas, people have been taught all sorts of nonsense that they have integrated into their, their or you know, sort, sort of tried to integrate into their way of thinking about the world. And these involve things like, um, it will just do some further contrast. Um, you, you met, well, first of all, let me address your point about, you know, people look at the stars or maybe they look at the, you know, Grand Canyon and they're like, oh, we're so small because look at, look at how big the universe is or, or how marvelous, you know, these natural aspects of, of, of Earth are. Um, well, who can contemplate that? Who can do things about that? Who can understand the geology, you know, the, the geology of the rocks in the Grand Canyon? Who can understand the distance between, uh, you know, stars and planets and, and, and travel from one planet to another and put satellites in the sky so that we can have these conversations? 
we do that. We are the marvelous things in this year. We're the most marvelous thing in this universe because we, we can actually understand the nature of things in the universe and then take action to, to uh, make our lives uh, wonderful on the basis of that knowledge. So sure, we're, I'm smaller than the universe in the, in the sense of a physical smallness, right? I'm tiny relative to that. But I'm the only thing, you are the only thing, human beings are the only things in the universe that we know of that can actually contemplate the nature of things and then do something about it, right, to, to be creative. And that makes us, in, in a beautiful sense of the term, freaks of nature. We, we're the weird ones in this place uh, because we have this amazing faculty uh, of reason, which, which is really just a marvelous thing. And the essence of being a human is taking that fact seriously. And what religion tells us to do from a very young age um, is to not take that seriously, but instead to, children are told by their parents, look, there's a God, and their parents, preachers, and teachers tell them this, there's a God, and you have to believe in him. And they, they pressure the kid to believe that there's a God. Well, here's the thing, Johnny can't see God, there's no evidence for God, so what a parent or a preacher or a teacher is doing with a, a four or five year old kid when they're telling him you have to believe in God is they're teaching the child to lie before he even knows what honesty is. They're in effect saying you can't see God any more than we can see him, but we want you to agree that he exists. And this is absolutely child abuse, according to objectivism. You are you are taking a child's mind, which is supposed to be his means of observing reality and integrating facts about reality so that he can understand the world and live, and you're telling him to turn his mind off and pretend that something is real when it's not real, when he doesn't know that it's real. So as, and Rand points this out in her journals, that what it does, is it teaches a child to lie before he knows what honesty is. But it does another thing. It teaches him to be a second hander before he knows what independence is. It teaches him to treat other people's views, his parents, preachers, and his teachers, teaches him to treat their views of what's true as more important than his own judgment of reality at, at just the perceptual level. And this is, again, this is just child abuse. But we're all raised like this, or many of us are raised like this. And so what's happening right off the bat is your parents, preachers, and teachers are chipping away at your rational faculty, at your confidence in your rational faculty. And so by the time you get to a conversation like this, you have been so convinced by your culture that faith is a legitimate means of understanding the world and you should believe in God or you're a bad person. And then you hear somebody like me freely saying, well, look, there's really no evidence for God. You should just take reason as your means of knowledge. Is that controversial? It's super controversial. People your age, young, young people who have been raised to believe that God is real and faith is a means of knowledge and all the religious mumbo jumbo, they find this shocking. Even though on some level, it should be common sense as you have pointed out. So what Rand's philosophy says to them, and she's got one of the core virtues of her philosophy is independent thinking. Independent thinking, using your mind, and what people need to do is they need to step back from the stuff they've been told by their parents, preachers, and teachers, and they need to ask themselves, what do I think? What makes sense to me? Where, what, is, what is there evidence for and what is there not evidence for, for me to, to accept? And if they do that, they will start to free themselves from falsehoods that, they, that have been foisted on them since they were very young. Not only were they told that faith and, and, and revelation are means of knowledge, when that's not even true, they were also told that being moral consists in self-sacrificially serving other people, giving up your values to help other people live their lives. So you're, you're, you're not important, other people are important. And Rand comes along and says, why? Why is that the case? Well, the question why is, uh, 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 is, is a quest for a reason. What reason is there for me to sacrifice for other people? And Rand points out that no one has ever given a good reason, an earthly reason. All the reasons that parents, preachers, and teachers give to kids about why they should sacrifice are, you should sacrifice because God said so, or you should sacrifice because your parents said so, or because that's the cultural norm or whatever. None of it is, well, look, Johnny, here are the facts of reality that give rise to the need of a sacrifice. There are no facts that give rise to the need of, of self-sacrifice, which is why no one can point to any facts that give rise to that need, right? 
So the answer to your question, Pedro, is that yes, when I present these ideas just in a straightforward, positive sense, it sounds like common sense, because in a certain sense, it is common sense. But what we have been taught by our parents, preachers, and teachers is a bunch of baloney that we need to challenge. And I'm not saying that you should just go against everything you've been told. Some of the things you've been taught may be true. But your job as an independent thinker is to step back and say what genuinely makes sense and what doesn't. What makes it to the sensory level for me? What, what corresponds to my looking at reality and hearing the world and experiencing the world? And this is the place that people need to start if they want to free themselves from, from false ideas that are, that are holding them back. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And before Thiago uh, come up with another question, I'm sure he has many. I just wanted to give you a personal uh, uh, perspective that uh, like in my childhood and throughout my uh, uh, my early ages in, in college, people are saying you need to find a job that, you know, fulfills you when, like as you're serving other people. And deep inside, I would never tell anyone, but I was thinking, OK, what is wrong with me because i don't have this desire to be serving other people all my life i want to find a job that makes me happy and enables me to uh, like enables me financially to do the things i want you know to be with my friends with my family to travel every year if i want to so what's wrong with me and when i started to read Ayn Rand's uh, novels and i attended level up uh, it was amazing because I finally got to see that I have other people who are like-minded and don't think the way uh, most of the people do. And it, it is uh, making another parenthesis. It is good for our audience to know that Craig uh, runs a yearly uh, event named Level Up. It happens in the United States and brings hundreds of people uh, to talk about philosophy, sociology, all uh, other areas of humanities, even practical things such as nutrition and exercises, all uh, based on Ayn Rand's philosophical uh, framework. So feel free to see in uh, the Objective Standard Institute uh, a social media about it, and maybe you'll be there next year. Yeah, thank you for uh, for mentioning Level Up. It's a, it's a great event, and I know you guys have been and really really enjoyed it yourselves, and a bunch of your friends have. So I encourage people to check that out. But Pedro, I wanna I wanna elaborate on a point that you just made because it's a really important integration to what I just said about you know uh, taking your life seriously and and not self sacrificially serving other people. The thing that's wrong with self sacrificially serving other people is not serving other people. We, you, in in a in a free market, you you have to serve other people in a certain sense, because that's how you, you you have to produce values and trade them with others to get the values that they have produced. Right? Specialization in in a free market is is a huge and important aspect of the way that the marketplace works and the, and the factual requirements of your life. Right? You need you need more than just the things that you produce. Right? I don't produce iPhones, but I need an iPhone. I don't produce cars, but I need a car. I don't produce massages, but if I my back is is out of whack, I need a nice massage, right? So all of these things are really important. And there's not only is there not anything wrong with serving other people, serving other people is extremely important and it's a, it's it's a great aspect of life. <clears throat> the important thing is to do it in a way that is mutually beneficial where both both parties gain from the exchange, right? And this is Rand's trader principle. This is, Ayn, Ayn Rand calls this the trader principle. Whether it's uh, a physical trade, you know, I have a banana and you have a dollar and we exchange the banana for the dollar, or whether it's a spiritual exchange, which is what friendships and romantic relationships are, right? You, Your friends, you and your friends, don't just, you know, trade widgets all the time, right? you go out and have joyful experiences together and you trade ideas and 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 spiritual things and rand takes this fact about human life that we're beings of both body and mind matter and spirit really seriously and the trading aspect of this is in a sense all about serving other people or gaining uh, and exchanging values with other people so nothing about rational egoism is against that. It's in fact all about that or all for that. 
the thing that that Rand opposes and the thing that's genuinely bad for human life is sacrificial trade, where instead of both sides gaining from the exchange, one side is losing from the exchange, right? So if I serve you but get nothing in return, and then I serve her and get nothing in return, and then I serve him and get nothing in return, what is happening to my life? Other people are getting values and I'm getting a loss of values. Well, if I keep doing that and don't pursue my values, I'm going to die. So if you take the idea seriously that you should do that, you can see that it's what Rand called a morality of death. To take sacrifice as the thing you should do is to take dying as the thing you should do. Well, that's a really bad idea. Why not take living as the thing that we should all do? Why not take, instead of sacrificing and giving up more important values for less important values or giving up values at a loss, why not say, let's all of us produce and then trade with each other so that we gain values in all of our exchanges, whether in our material exchanges or our spiritual exchanges, and then we can live these beautiful lives. So I, I wanted to, to dovetail with your point, Pedro, about the fact that you know, you were taught that you should selflessly serve others and you didn't like that selfless part, but you liked the idea of being productive and getting, you know, going into business or whatever. You didn't mind the serving part. There's nothing wrong with serving other people. You just, you just don't want to feel like you've got to give up your values in order to do that. And that's exactly. exactly, you know, that's in my view, that's exactly the correct attitude. You should, you should not want to give up your values. You should want to gain value. This is interesting because it seems it's where uh, Rand's philosophy meets an economic platform, which would be less of a capitalism, right? Uh, where you shouldn't be forced to do anything and, 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 and economic relations will happen based on mutual benefits for both sides. So is it, is it correct that less of a capitalism would be like the ideal platform for Rand's philosophy? Not yet. Yeah, yes. So you're making a really, really good point here, Tiago. <laughs> um, yes, laissez-faire capitalism is the political condition that is necessary for people to genuinely be able to think for themselves, produce as they see fit, trade with others by mutual consent to mutual advantage, right? Because what's going on there is free trade. They need freedom. They need to be able to be free to act and, and trade as they see fit. And laissez-faire capitalism is the social system that says no one may use physical force against other people. And if you do use physical force against other people, the government is going to come in and use retaliatory force to stop you from doing that because that, that retards human life. So we can't have it. And th the economic integration that you're pointing out, Tiago, is really important. And I like to think of it this way. If you know Say's Law, so J.B. Say, the, the, the uh, economist, has uh, what's called Say's Law. And the basic idea is if you want to trade values in the marketplace, you first have to produce values, right? Production comes before trade or supply constitutes demand is what it's, is the way it's sometimes put, right? You have to produce a widget before you have a widget to trade with a, you know, quadrant. If, if, you know, if you want to talk about two different items in, in the marketplace, if I want to, if, if I want to get your money or if I want to get your, legal services or your bananas or your massages, whatever the case may be, whatever you produce, I have to produce something first so I can say, hey, here's something I could give you in exchange for that. And what we're seeing here is, is a couple of things. First of all, we're seeing the primacy of production. Human beings have to produce values in order to live. And if we don't do that, we can't live because we have nothing to consume and we have nothing to trade. So Rand takes this very seriously and she says productive effort is a fundamental virtue in human life. You have to produce something so that you can, you know, use that to live your life. But it, it's it's even more profound than that, because um, if you if you think about Say's law, the idea that you've got to produce and, uh, you know, produce something that you you want to produce and then trade it with other people. Rand's whole philosophy, and she sums it up beautifully in one of her essays, she says her ethics, at least, uh, looks like this. God said, take what you want and pay for it, right? This is a Spanish proverb that she loved the sound of. Now, obviously, Rand is an atheist. So when she says God said, she does not mean 
a literal God said that you have to do something. What she means is reality is a certain way and it dictates certain things, right? Reality is a certain way. The world is such that if you want values, you have to produce values. That's how you get them. So God said means reality is a certain way. Take what you want is sort of the egoistic aspect of it. Hey, what do you want to do in your life to make your life wonderful? What, what, you know, imagine what your life would look like in a beautiful thing. What kind of work would you like to do? What kind of relationships would you like to have? What kind of recreational activities would you like to engage in? What would fill your soul with joy in the years and decades of your life? So that's what you want. That's sort of the centerpiece there. And then the last part of the, of the sentence is, and pay for it. Well, what does she mean by that? Well, how do you pay for what you want? How do you make what you want to have happen, happen? You use your mind and take the actions necessary to cause that effect, right? It's a cause and effect relationship. So what she's saying, and God said, take what you want and pay for it, is this is the three-part essence of her, of her ethics. Reality is a certain way. You should figure out what you want and go after it. And the way that you do that is by using your mind to think about what would be great and then to take the necessary actions to fill your life with those values. And this is very much like Say's law and it's like economics, if you think about it, right? Re economics recognizes that the marketplace is a certain way. Hey, if you wanna make money in the marketplace, you have to produce something. What would you like to produce? What would make your, your life awesome if you were to produce that thing? Okay, good, produce that and then trade it with other people, right? And it's got the same kind of relationship there. So Say's law and Ayn Rand's ethics go hand in hand. It's, it's almost as if the two are the same principle, one of them in, in the moral realm and the other one in the economic realm. And I love that. I, I love to think about it that way, particularly for guys like you and your audience, because you guys as leaders and, and people interested in economics and liberty, you guys understand economics well. At least, you know, you understand Austrian economics and sort of classical economics and in, in, in good economics. And if you understand that and you can see that there's a moral code that actually corresponds to this perfectly, I think it can help people to understand the value and the and the, and the um, the uh, hierarchical relationship between this moral code and that and that economics uh, system. Perfect. That's amazing. Um, so now that we've established here, like a, a, a general, a general basis for Rand's philosophy, uh, and as you said, our our audience here is more related to leaders, and I, we wanted to bring this to a more, let's say, practical and palpable field. Let's talk a little bit about uh, leadership, and we can even talk about leadership based on Rand's ideas. Because in all of Rand's novels, and I don't think we we quoted them by name here, so uh, some of the great, uh, it, it's probably one of the greatest books I've read is Atlas Shrugged. Uh, another great one is uh, The Fountainhead and uh, The Anthem. They're all great novels. And in all of those, there's always a figure of a very important leader. Uh, you have uh, Dagny Taggart in, in Atlas Shrugged. You have uh, Howard Rourke in the fountainhead um, and they're always very as you said before independent thinkers they reject that uh that the thing that ren calls of secondhand thinking uh i'd like you to elaborate a bit on this secondhand thinking uh idea that brand proposes us uh and also how do you see the importance of leadership in, in Rand's novels, in objectivism? How, what are the main attributes for a, for a very strong leader based on Rand's philosophy? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so when we get to something like leadership, which is itself, you know, uh, an area with principles, so it's a science and the application of those principles, it's an art, right? Every, you know, whether you're teaching or doing brain surgery or engaging in leadership, right? This is a specific field, a specific human endeavor with a sp specific purpose. What are you trying to do as a leader? Well, you're trying to help a team of people understand a mission and put their 
uh, their work together in a harmonious way to achieve that mission. That's a really important job and it's a difficult job because you're dealing with people and people have free will and they've got different values and different roles within a within an organization. So it's a really, really uh, challenging job leadership. And um, if you think about the framework of the objectivist ethics and the objectivist philosophy more broadly, you can think about it this way. A leader is someone who can step back from the from the, the, the from an organization and say, "Hey, what is the big picture here? What are we trying to do? And what is a leader doing when he when he or she does that? Well, he's using his mind, right? This is an act of reason. This is question asking. Uh, thinking is question asking. And when a leader leader steps back and says, "Hey, what are what are we trying to do? And what are the parts of this organization? And who's doing what? And how do those parts fit together? And how can I keep each of the uh, the, the teams and the individuals within the teams in this organization motivated to enjoy their work, do their work well, and work in harmony with each other. This is a huge job. You're dealing not only with economic factors, you're dealing with psychological factors, you're dealing with personalities, you're dealing with a lot, right? So leadership is one of the one of the richest and and most sort of complex kinds of jobs that there is out there. You're dealing with all sorts of, of things. You've got to use reason to do that, but you also have to use empathy. You have to you have to be able to recognize how people uh, what motivates people, how people are reacting to your your discussions with them, how teams are getting along, and when there's any conflict between them, how can you come in and say, "Hey, here's a principle we can use to uh, ensure that these two aspects of the business, these two teams, get along rather than having some conflict." I'll give you an example. If you've got a marketing team and they're telling the producers of the product that you're trying to sell, hey, you guys need to make the product more along these lines because that's what we need to do to market it. And the, the producers are saying, yes, but we also need to make sure that the thing has these values that we know are super important, but that the marketplace doesn't even understand yet, right? So there might be some you know, difference of opinion between the two teams about how to work together. Well, a good leader comes in and says to them, hey, guys, <clears throat> let's take a look at this from the high level. <clears throat> We're all trying to do the same thing, produce a great product and sell it. So let's come together and have a meeting about how we can ensure that the producers of the product and the people who are, have to market that product are on the same page and there's a sweet spot here even if we have differences of opinion about the way that things should be done there's a sweet spot where we'll be able to agree right and a good leader comes in and he makes that happen right he 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 calls that meeting he brings them together he explains the principle behind this idea so that then those two teams can embrace that principle and move forward more productively and in and in harmony together <clears throat> so what's going on here You've got reason at play, recognition of the fact that emotions are involved and they're important, although they're not our means of knowledge, they're important. People feel different ways, right, about different things, and we've got to take that into account. <laughs> you, have, uh, you have the issue of trade, okay? We're trying to produce this stuff and trade it in the marketplace. You've got to trade even between the teams. These guys are trying to give, the, the marketing team is trying to give the production team ideas that can help them that's a spiritual trade and the the production team is trying to give the marketing team ideas that can help them and help them all to understand so you have you have not only physical trades but spiritual trades going on and the leaders of the organization or the leadership in the organization is trying to orchestrate all of this really really big job really important and what Rand shows in her novels is that the people who do this really well are, the, in, in a sense, the most important people within an organization, not more important than other people, morally speaking. There's not any moral significance of the, of the importance. The guy, a janitor sweeping the floor in Taggart Transcontinental, to one of the businesses in Atlas Shrugged, right, is every bit as important morally as as the the the, the, the CEO of Taggart Transcontinental. There's not a moral difference, but the importance to the business, right? If that janitor goes away and you have to hire another janitor, that's relatively easy to do. If the 
CEO fails and have to go away. And it's really hard to find a CEO to replace a CEO who's doing really well because it's a much more complex job. And Rand talks about this um, when she says that there's a pyramid of ability within the marketplace and within uh, businesses. And again, the pyramid of ability does not mean a moral difference, right? The janitor is not morally less significant than someone else, but he does not contribute as much to the business as the leadership does. He just doesn't because he doesn't know all of the parts and integrate all of the parts that are that that bring all of the teams and individuals and, and productive units together. So this is what leadership is. You a, a leader is really at the top of a productive pyramid within a company. And it's an extremely complex and fascinating and important job. And so a uh, great question. But you can see how all of these principles that I mentioned earlier in our discussion here come to bear on this issue. And, and a leader, a really good leader, has to take these ideas you know, in, into account and use them uh, to, to get his or her work done. Craig. And I wanted to get to know, uh, like since we are talking about leadership and you just make this great con contribution, I wanted to know more about you and I'm sure that our audience as well. So uh, I'm asking, were there any important obstacles that you overcame in order to found your institute right now? Could you, uh, or maybe not right before opening it, but the years the, the, uh, throughout your career, uh, could you share these ob obstacles with us for you to become the leader that you are today? Sure, and uh, and I'm still a work in progress. Let me make something, <laughs> uh, make a point really early in, in, in my answer to this, which is that you never get to the end of the road where it's like, I'm done, I've, I've gotten leadership mastered and I'm just, I don't have anything else to learn. Um, and you know, you, that's not a thing. Life is not um, an end state that you get to. It's a process, right? And it's an ongoing process. And leadership is an ongoing process. And relationships are an ongoing. Everything is an ongoing process. All these aspects of life. Now, sometimes you there are you know, if I if I need to get to from Florida to New York and I drive there, sure, there are certain things you get done and they're done. And you, you know, that's that's uh, I'm not I'm not saying that that's not true. But uh, but the learning process and expanding your knowledge and, and, and getting better and better at doing this thing we call living or doing business or whatever it is, that's a never ending process until you die. And then, you know, everything's over then. Um, but um, but it is really a process. So, you know, how did I get into this and and uh, and and, you know, get to to the knowledge level that I have about this? I became fascinated with Ayn Rand's ideas when I read The Fountainhead. Uh, this was in about 1990. Um, and uh, I was at the time a furniture designer. I, I was not um, into ideas yet. And I'm dyslexic. So it's, reading is actually quite difficult for me because I switch words around and letters around when I'm looking at them. And um, so I wasn't a big reader, but uh, some for some reason, another story I, I could tell, but I won't. Uh, I started reading The Fountainhead even though it was uh, a bit of a task for me to read. And I fell in love with the book and couldn't put it down. So I kept reading it. And then I fell in love with Howard Rourke and the ideas, and not only with the ideas, but with Ayn Rand's ability to communicate ideas. And for the next four years, I just read everything I could get my hands on of Rand's ideas. And I came to the conclusion that I not only loved the ideas, but I wanted to, to change careers. I wanted to become a communicator of these ideas and help other people to understand them because they're so powerful and so life-serving. So I switched careers and that was a whole, <clears throat> a whole task in and of itself. And I had a lot of help in doing that. So let me plug right now uh, in this answer, the fact that, uh, you know, even though independence is real and it's a virtue and, uh, you know, it's me driving this ship in effect when I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life, I got a lot of help along the way uh, from really good people. And it's important that you you recognize the value of good people. I had uh, a, a, dear, a, a man who became a dear friend of mine uh, when I first met him. I was just going to him with a business plan. He became a dear friend of mine. He wound up funding my writing of my first book, and he wound up funding the launching of my journal, The Objective Standard, and um, and really helped to get me off the ground. And so 
some of the difficulties in doing something along the lines of what I've done, starting a journal and starting a, 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 an organization like Objective Standard Institute, you have to get support from people. And the way you get that is by demonstrating that you are capable of, of doing something and then going to people who can see that demonstration and then are willing to help you. So it's really important that you, you, you take um, relationships with other rational, productive people seriously, right? That you, I, I don't do things on my own uh, in, in the grand scheme of things. I do things with teams and other people, and they're really important. But at the personal level, the thing that's really important is that you stay focused on, on your mission, on what you've decided you want to do, that you get your values in order and that you use your time really, really well to get the things done that you want to do. And fortunately, Ayn Rand's philosophy gives all sorts of advice about this. You guys are probably aware that Ayn Rand has this whole theory about how uh, you need to hierarchize your values, talk, get your values in order in your life of their relative importance to each other. So my career is really important because it is the thing that pays for other things in my life, but it's also the thing that gives me a sense of purpose at a very big level and self-esteem because I gain self-esteem by achieving values and, and being successful in life. So I took Rand's ideas really seriously as I pursued a new career in advancing these ideas, uh, 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 the launching of a journal, later the launching of Objective Standard Institute, which I launched with my wife, and I took really seriously the, the need to find good people to work with, good, thoughtful, productive, independent thinking people, right? You, don't, you do not want, uh, uh, Tiago, this will tie into your question about second-handedness. Um, you do not want to work with people who don't think for themselves. You want to work with people who are willing to challenge you. As If you're a leader, the first thing you should tell your teams that you work with is, I don't know everything. And your job is to think and to tell me what you think so that you can help me to think better and level up because I'm going to be wrong sometimes and you're going to be right sometimes and I need to hear it, right? And we need to have those conversations, right? So there's, a, there's, a, ob there's an objectivity. Sometimes people might call this humility. Oh, you know, you don't know everything. So feel like humility is the wrong word because humility makes it sound, you know, humility is a, a sort of a Christian virtue. And the idea is, well, who am I to say? This is not humility. This is objectivity to say that I don't know everything and that I can learn from other people. Why is it objectivity? Because it's a fact. And we all know that it's true that we don't know everything, right? So it's, it's it, to, to accept that and embrace that as a part of your leadership is really, really important. And one of the, my strengths is that I've always been good at that. I've always been good at saying to the people I work with, hey, I don't know everything here. We're going to work on this together, right? I have a plan. I might be the leader. I'm coming in with a general overarching plan. But this plan is subject to change when we discover new information that uh, helps us understand things at a better level, right? So I, th I think the short answer to the question, how did I manage to become where I am today and doing the things I'm doing today, I took Ayn Rand's ideas seriously. I took the, the principles of this philosophy seriously. I used my mind. I traded with people. I used good judgment about people. Sometimes I judged poorly. I've had some relationships go south because people were dishonest or they couldn't, or they, they, they weren't good at the work that, that, that they were hired to do, which is not necessarily a moral flaw, but whatever. So, and you have to pivot and make adjustments as you go. And I've been pretty good at doing that. And therefore, um, you know, the application of Rand's ideas to the business of living and building teams and pursuing missions um, is, is what I've done and I'm still doing it. So uh, that, that, that's the answer to how I do things uh, relatively well. Well, Perfect. I Thank think you. we're just wanted to sum up. I think that we had a lot of lessons here, Tiago. So basically, be like uh, act according to your values, have a cr critical thinking, always be humble with your peers. These are be a objective. Good, be be uh, objective. Uh, don't don't be. I don't. I, I would say. I, I, sorry to interrupt, but. I oppose the word humble because it, it implies mm. humility, like who am I to say? Or like it, it implies that you are, you're not important in some way. 
But that's mm -hmm. not true that you're not important. And as a leader, you're really important in that context. But you still don't know everything. And that's just a fact. So I think the, the proper term here is not humility, but objectivity. Great, great point. And, and Craig, I feel that uh, about what you said about leadership, which is managing a group of people. And um, I, I feel like nowadays it's getting increasingly harder to manage uh, larger groups of people because people are getting more diverse and having different opinions and polarized and everything that we have been listening to in the, in the past few years. And um, even though we as, uh, I'm, I'm going to say libertarians or even classic liberals or objectivists, we don't talk much about diversity as the left does and, and which has led them to wokeism, which is another different game. Um, we have been uh we have to deal with different kinds of thoughts even if we don't discuss diversity that broadly but uh i'd like to to ask you something about your book loving life that i've read yeah. and I, I was midway through it when i noticed that it was published in 2002 so 22 years ago and uh it it it, it struck me that you're in this game for a long time already, which is amazing. And uh, and at the time, you wrote an afterword called Terrorism, Altruism, and Moral Certainty. Um, and at the time, I, I think you were writing about terrorism because 9-11 was so close to terrorist attacks and everything. And uh, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on this moral certainty. What is that? And do you see a lack of this moral certainty uh, that you refer to in the book in this civilization clashes uh, that I'm going to call them civilization classes that clashes that we're seeing nowadays, like wokeism and, for instance, the massive wave of immigration in Europe, the clashes in the Middle East, in Russia. How do you see all of that? And um, what has changed in this 22 years since the publication of your book, Loving Life? Yeah, <laughs> great question. Um, so moral certainty uh, is, is you know, I, I focus on that in that appendix of the book because at the time, George uh, W. Bush was, was president and 9-11 had happened, uh, you know, less than uh, six months before I, before I published that book. 9-11 had, had literally just happened. And so I added that appendix to, to point out that we had just been attacked by um, Islamic terrorists uh, who were supported by Iran and Saudi Arabia. And uh, everyone knew that, but no one wanted to say it. No one wanted to name the actual enemy, which is people who take uh, Islam seriously and therefore try to kill infidels because their scriptures and their religion tell them to kill infidels. Uh, and this is true, by the way, not only of uh, of Islam, but of Christianity uh, as well, and also to some extent of, of Judaism. Although in Judaism, uh, God does most of the killing in, instead of, uh, uh, although he orders other people to kill too. So there, there's killing is going on all over the place in the name of God in all three of the ma major monotheistic religions. But the one that had attacked us on 9-11 was Islam, uh, or the, the people who took Islam seriously, and they're called jihadists. And no one was recognizing this or saying it outside of a very small group of people, basically objectivists, who were willing to point out what had actually happened. And so I was talking about moral certainty in that appendix, because if you are going to take morality seriously, one of the first things you have to do is say, what is the fundamental principle of morality? What is the standard of morality? And as you know, Tiago, from reading my book, in that book, I show how Ayn Rand de derives at the or uh, derives the principle that the factual requirements of human life constitute the standard of moral value. What we're supposed to do, what what we ought to do, to use moral terminology, right, as human beings is figure out how to live and then do that thing, live. 
live beautiful lives. And what we need for that is to be productive and be thoughtful and trade with each other and have freedom and all the things we've already talked about in, in, this, uh, in this discussion. But what happens when some religious group decides our God tells us to kill people for his will because he wants us to, and then they go and do that is you have a conflict, right? A deadly conflict. And if the people being attacked do not stand up and say, hey, what they are doing is morally wrong, and that's a matter of fact, not a matter of opinion, and we can point to the facts as to why that's a matter of fact, and we have a moral right to defend ourselves in whatever way is necessary to stop these monsters from attacking us, and we're going to do that, and we don't care what the world thinks about it because we are morally correct in our reaction, and the attackers are morally wrong in their attack, and all of this moral language, that is what is needed to defend yourselves when you're attacked by monsters who believe in a guy in the sky who tells them to kill you. And so this is what was happening. And I wanted to bring to the fore in, 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 in my book, in the end of that book, how the principles that I had just laid out in the book apply to this emergency situation of being attacked by these monsters who believe in Allah. And so I did, and I wrote that there. Now you say, what has changed since then? Unfortunately, not much, because we, al although we, you know, we we went after, uh, we invaded Iraq, which was basically a secular uh, uh, country at the time that really was not the core problem. Uh, the the core problem was Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, and then we invaded Afghanistan uh, to, and did a half-ass job there, trying to get uh, get Bin Laden and some of the other people involved in Al Qaeda. Uh, instead of standing tall and proud and saying, we are morally right and we're going to find you vermin wherever you are and we're going to kill every last one of you until the rest of you raise a white flag and say, we quit, you are stronger than Allah. And that is the way that morally certain people defend themselves. They recognize the value of their lives, the value of their free societies and the immorality of anybody who tries to attack that. And when someone does try to attack that, a morally certain group of people go and they take their military and they destroy the attackers completely and immediately. And this is, by the way, exactly what uh, Israel should do now and is not doing now when they are attacked by Hamas and Hezbollah and when everyone knows that that is being supported by Iran. What Israel should do and what the United States should do and support Israel in doing today is standing up tall and saying human life is the standard of moral value our societies try to protect human life by protecting individual rights and enabling people to make their own judgments and live their own lives we don't treat women as less important we don't treat different races as less important although atheism uh, although there's no such thing as a god in reality people are free and, and properly free to believe in God if they want to, but what they're not free to do is implement any of their uh, commandments from their alleged God that tell them to kill people. You're not allowed to. So freedom of religion doesn't mean you get to implement all of the ideas from your religion, because all of the religions in some way or form tell people to kill people who don't believe in their religion. So you don't get to enact your religion. And the way that a free society operates, and unfortunately for, for Israel, you know, it, 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 to some extent, Israel is based on a religion. But the fact of the matter is, even though they are based on a religion, which they shouldn't be, they nevertheless are more rights protecting and more rights respecting than any of the other countries in the region. And they're certainly more rights respecting and protecting than any of the uh, is, Islamic uh, dictatorships and, and, and terrorist groups that are trying to attack and kill them. So what Israel should do is stand morally tall and say, we're right because we protect rights. You are wrong because you violate rights. And we're going to crush you now. And after we crush you, we're going to step back and say, that's how we do things. So please don't try to attack us again. And if you do try to attack us again, we will annihilate whoever tried to attack us. And this is moral certainty. And sorry for my temper getting a little bit high here. But we have all just witnessed in the past couple of years 
a sect of monstrous religionists march into a small country of peaceful people and slaughter them right before our eyes. And what is needed is absolutely moral certainty here. But you can't get moral certainty if you think morality comes from a made-up guy in the sky, which unfortunately the Israelis, for the most part, believe. And you can't get morality here in the United States if you believe that same thing, which about half of the country believes. They, oh yeah, moral morality comes from God's commandments. Or the other half believes morality is whatever we decide it is. Neither of those two things are true. Religion is false and subjectivism is false. What's true and what gives us moral certainty is when we look at reality and say, hey, why do we need morality at all? What are values? And do the thinking that Ayn Rand has encouraged people to do to come to the rationally observable conclusion that the factual requirements of human life constitute the standard of moral value? And that what we should do is live, pursue our values and respect the rights of other people to do the same. And when somebody tries to attack the people who are trying to do that, the attackers are morally wrong and should be eliminated as quickly as possible. So there's moral certainty and the reason why we need it. Well, thank you, Craig. And despite you mentioned that not a lot changed in this aspect, I can see other topics that may uh, may have changed. For example, the ge generations who have been uh, studying about uh, objectivism and how to be a thoughtful leader. And since we are going to our last question of the podcast, I wanted to know more about the youth that you have been addressing. And just to give a, uh, a context, the biggest delivery that we mentioned for, from Objective Standard Institute is the Level uh, Up Conference. And as we get to interact with this younger audience, what do you see as their main difficulties for these generations to, you know, to become strong and impactful leaders? Do you see some change from the previous generations that you have uh, interacting with? So I'm yeah. talking specifically about the Gen Z generation. Yes, and thank you for uh, for directing the end of this conversation to something more positive because <laughs> we kept going on 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 terrorism and and our need for moral certainty and that's a, a fairly negative thing. But look, uh, when I said not much, but really, ne but really needed, right? So yeah. I appreciate your uh, your contribution to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's an unfortunately uh, necessary topic at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're but and when I said that not much has changed, I was talking in terms of foreign policy and moral certainty about our foreign policy. A lot has changed in terms of of the culture, and not all of it for the bad. I mean, there's a lot of bad in the culture. You guys mentioned, you know, wokeism, which is just sort of a short term uh, phrase or a new term that probably isn't really even accurate given its roots. But what it really refers to is the far left idea that Western values are bad and any attack on Western values is good. That, that's really what that stuff's all about. And that's a horrible idea because Western values, at least the essence of Western values, is that reason is efficacious, that human beings are individuals, and that we need freedom so that we can live. Those are, that's the essence of, of liberalism and Western values, and it's all good. What we need to do is understand a deeper um, philosophical framework to support all of that, and this is what objectivism offers. So I'm actually quite optimistic right now, even though culturally there's a lot going south, right? There's a, the, 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 the hard left is, it has, at least in the United States, has really infiltrated the schools. This has happened in much of the Western world, certainly in the UK and other places as well. And that's really bad. But here's what's really good. We have this body of ideas from Ayn Rand and from uh, other thinkers that are trying to integrate uh, additional powerful good ideas with Ayn Rand's ideas. And uh, a large number, not, not huge in terms of, of sheer numbers, but in terms of, um, in, in terms of a percentage of the population that is necessary to actually make change, it's, it's significant that a lot of young people like you guys around the world, people engaging with OSI, coming to level up, 
people engaging with Students for Liberty and the Foundation for Economic Education, and a lot of these organizations that are kind of working together to try to uh, help the rising generation understand the importance of liberty and the philosophic framework and, and, and ideas that undergird it. A lot of young people are starting to learn these ideas. And again, when I say a lot, I don't mean in terms of, of just sheer numbers, but it's, you know, majorities are not what change the cultures, right? Look at the founding fathers of the United States. It was a small minority of, of, of men and their, and their wives and who, who thought about these ideas, came to understand them well enough to, uh, you know, at the time they didn't have Ayn Rand's ideas, obviously, but they had the concept of individual rights and they had it in the lock, you know, lock in framework from John Locke and, uh, and, and earlier thinkers. And they were able to do a lot with these ideas. And this was just a small handful of people, relatively speaking. Well, we're in the same situation today, except we have better ideas now. We have more powerful ideas and we have the internet and we have the ability to engage with each other the way that we're doing it now. And we have guys like you and the, and the, and the people you work with who are fascinated by ideas and interested in learning about this stuff and are willing to get out there and use these ideas and advance these ideas. So what's going to happen if we keep doing that? In my view, what's going to happen is we're going to win this battle for Western civilization and for freedom and for good living and for flourishing. I think we're going to win this. Um, we have a, a long battle ahead and we've got to reach a lot of minds and there's a lot of work to be done. But I see that work happening and I see more and more people kind of coming into the fold and getting in, involved. So I, uh, a lot has changed for the worse culturally, but a lot has changed at a sort of a more fundamental level for the better. And it's not really, the, the, the fruit of that better change is not yet being seen in the same way that we see, you know, the wokest making the news every night because they're throwing soup at another painting in some museum or whatever nonsense they're engaging in. That stuff makes the news because news is all about, you know, uh, you know, sensationalism. What doesn't make the news is a conversation like this. And the next thing that you guys are going to do to help advance these ideas to another group of people who will start to think about them and be independent and go out and make change. But this stuff is happening, even if it's not seen. You know, Frederick Bastiat's uh, The Seen and the Not Seen, right? So this is some of the stuff that is not being seen in the culture at least not as visibly as as you know the the you know attacks of uh, on Western uh, civilization in the news, but it is happening, and so I am very much heartened by this, and I am very optimistic that we are going to win this battle. And in fact, not only are we going to win this battle, there's a sense in which we are already winning this battle. We're winning it because we're in it. And because we have the winning ideas and because we know that these ideas are true, at least the people who have studied them and started to get their head around these ideas, we know they're true. We have the moral certainty I mentioned earlier. And it's not just a moral certainty about how we should deal with people who try to attack us. It's also a more positive type of moral certainty about how we should live our lives, how we should engage our minds and our productive efforts and the way that we engage with other people, trading value for value, recognizing that other people have rights, recognizing that emotions are very important, but that they're not our means of knowledge, and all of the other stuff that we've talked about. If we get this, if a small group of dedicated, active-minded people come to understand these ideas and start to disseminate them, we win. So I'm optimistic and I love that you guys are doing what you're doing because we're in this together and um, it's an important uh, an important movement. And in the, in the process, let me just end with this. In the process, what's most important of all is that you keep loving your life while doing it because the point of your life is to live and love it. And uh, the battle is not an end in itself. The battle is a means for us to, to be able to live beautiful lives. And uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the end goal. 
Well said. I love your your, your quotes, Craig. They are, they, they are very uh, optimistic and they may uh, they bring uh, enthusiasm in it. So uh, we can see that you uh, you you really believe in what you're saying. And I just wanted to uh, make sure that you are aware that you can count on us uh, in Brazil. You know, especially people the people from our institute. We have been doing this work for more than 10 years and we already impacted and created many new leaders. So if you ever need someone from Brazil, here we are. <laughs> Thank you. But, Pedro, if I might yeah. at the end here, just make a few recommendations. Uh, you guys have already recommended um, uh, level up conferences for people, but I wanna let your audience and, and listeners know just about a couple things. First of all, um, if you're fascinated by anything we've said in this conversation, read the books by Ayn Rand. Uh, you just, you're, 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 I think your mind will be blown at how powerful and uh, clear her ideas are. So read her fiction, uh, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Read her nonfiction, uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, uh, Philosophy Who Needs It, Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, and her other books. I, they're just the most important books that have ever been written if you care about these kinds of ideas. Uh, also, look into Objective Standard Institute and the work that we do. It's objectivestandardinstitute.org. Um, we teach courses on these ideas. We teach reading groups on these ideas, run conferences. We have podcasts. Uh, you can get speakers uh, like me. We have a whole uh, group of fellows who can speak on these ideas, and they're all over the world. So we have speakers in in UK and in Europe and uh, uh, you know pretty much anywhere you need speakers. Um, and get involved, start learning about these ideas. Read and study them critically. Don't just accept ideas because some new group of people is telling you that they're true. That's not thinking. Remember, you all, the, the core virtue of the objectivist ethics is think for yourself, demand that the ideas make sense, right? But get involved. And if these ideas do make sense to you, what you're going to discover is that you too can have the kind of moral certainty that you see in me because you will learn that your life matters, your mind matters, freedom matters, and you'll understand why all of this matters. And, uh, and, and you'll, you, you'll have a, a body of conceptual tools that will serve you for the rest of your life very well. So I just wanted to say, you know, look into the ideas and get involved. I completely agree with the optimistic perspective here. I'm on the same boat as you guys. And uh, uh, I was I was gonna ask you that question, Craig. If you had anything to uh, like to indicate some books for us, you just indicated some by Ayn Rand, and you quoted one by Bastia before. Is one of the readings included in our uh, leadership training program at IFLSP? If any of the listeners, even in the U.S. or in Brazil, wants to know our institute, it's called IFLSP as well. Uh, you're always invited, Craig, to our activities. And we could extend this conversation forever. We could talk for hours and hours, but we have limited time, unfortunately. So uh, we'd like to end asking you for another recommendation of any other book you'd like. Not by Anne Rand this time, if you, if <laughs> sure. you might, because you just indicated some by her. Yeah. But, uh, Anyway, but we, we were like about to, to ask yeah. you, right? Chia, we, we were about were... to ask you, yes, yes, yes. Regarding yeah. Ayn Rand, but you already answered. Yes. Sure, sure. So I'll plug a couple more books. Uh, read my book, Loving Life, which uh, yes. Tiago held up earlier. Um, it's an introduction, basically, to rational egoism or Ayn Rand's ideas. It's a quick read. It's 150 pages, very short. Uh, it'll give you a good overview of the ideas. Um, I recommend strongly that in addition to visiting objectivestandard.org, you look into my journal uh, that uh, that I uh, started uh, in 2006. It's called The Objective Standard. So it's got a similar name to the organization, but it's a separate thing. It's The Objective Standard Journal, and that's theobjectivestandard.com. And you can read a steady stream of articles written from the perspective of these ideas. We, we have new articles every week, and we've got a quarterly journal that comes out you know, four times a year. Um, so that's really uh, Im important uh, reading. I think your your listeners would get a lot out of that. And the last thing I'll say is um, follow me and uh, the other fellows from Objective Standard Institute on social media. 
So look up, uh, you can find me on, on Twitter and on YouTube. I, I just started kind of a YouTube channel where I'm doing regular videos and, um, and I'm getting more and more active on Twitter. Uh, but look up our fellows. There's John Hersey, uh, Angel Walker Worth, uh, Thomas Walker Worth, Kaya Willis, uh, Martin Hoos. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone and I apologize if that's happening, guys. But check out the, the fellows at OSI and follow their work. We're producing all sorts of, uh, of content about these ideas and, um, and engage with us because you'll learn a lot by having conversations with people and, um, and just getting involved. And that's a good way to do it. Thank you very Thank much, you, Greg. Greg. Uh, and uh, I'm going to make sure to, you know, put all of these links. Feel free to share uh, the links with us as well, the necessary links, so we can, you know, uh, share with our audience, our associates, and also the external public. We will post this episode on Spotify. And now, addressing our audience, thank you for being here with us throughout this hour. And this was another edition of our podcast, Turning All the Lights. Uh, please follow us on social media as well, IFLSP, and we hope to see you again next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you very much, Greg. Bye-bye. Great, great. It was amazing. It was amazing. Thank you very much for your time, Craig. It was a My very nice pleasure. talk. Uh, love that you guys are doing this. Please keep up this this work. It's so important. Um, we, 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 you know... We have the ideas, we've just got to get them out there and help more people understand them. Um, let me ask a favor from you. Um, when, when you get this video you know, ready to go, please share it with me so I can uh, uh, share the raw footage with me, after, you know, raw edited footage, right? So mm -hmm. that my team can cut shorts out of this to use and help further promote. The, they'll link, oh. if you do that, Every time they do that, they'll link to the full length one at your channel. But we mm -hmm. like we always like to take cuts of this and and oh, use cool. it on social media. Yes, oh, yes, good. for sure. Mm -hmm. We will keep in touch. Um, in in October, we will have mm -hmm. our our forum, and this forum has a public of five hundred people. Um, and like for, for this edition uh like it is a, like we are a bit short on time but i think that we should definitely keep in touch you know to see maybe some uh, things to do together that, that would be nice we already had many associates uh, like uh chago and i who already attended the conference of osi so it is nice to make this official you know we yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, for sure yeah let's keep working together it's a, that integration is really important so i love it Okay, great. Well, thank you very much again, Craig, and I hope you have a great week and send my regards to Sarah, to everyone on the team. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Have a nice one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.